Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Randy Packett. I'm the founder and CEO of Chesapeake Capital Management. I want to welcome you to our webinar. We've been doing this webinar for several times this year, and we have taken the time off this uh, last couple of months, but we're going to try to start this back up. So if anybody want to join us, not only for today, but also in any of the future webinars, you're welcome to join us. We are expecting about 40 plus people to sign, join us today. They have signed up. So we're gonna wait about 30 seconds or so to get this started. So just wait, get yourself a glass of water or something to drink, and I'll be with you in about 30 seconds to a minute. Thank you for being with us. Okay, folks, so let's get this uh, webinar, webinar started. Uh, I wanna welcome you uh, to our webinar. This is a halftime report. Uh, we're delighted to see most of you who have signed up already joined us. Uh, I'm sure that some people will be uh, keep on signing up in the next few minutes, but I'm gonna go ahead and get this thing started. So I wanna draw your attention to these disclosures we have, please take a few moments to review them and let me know uh, by email or calling us to let us know if you have any questions. Um, basically is letting you know that we get this information from uh, companies we work with and we get a lot of our good information to share with you through, through them. And if you have not done so, if you happen to have your uh, phone nearby, um, just silence that just in case that, you know, phone calls come in and I don't know if you muted everything, but we just want to keep that in mind so that we're not disturbing everyone else who's trying to listen to us. So one of our goals today is to discuss some factors that have influenced 2021's market performance thus far, and then review the underlying fundamentals. It will be impossible to cover everything that's happened so far but we believe that focusing on some key developments may help give you a clear picture of the market. Today, we will review where we've been, some key economic fundamentals, and what may lie ahead in the second half of the year. I know because we, have, we didn't do this meeting last month, so we already are in halfway through, uh, a little bit more than halfway through the third quarter, but we're gonna cover the first six months of the year. This broad view is designed to help you to stay informed and give you better understanding of some of the perspective that help guide our investing, uh, investing process. So let's begin by reviewing how the stock market has performed in the first half. Here's the snapshot of the S&P 500 index performance from December 2020 to May 2021. The S&P 500 index tracks the market capitalization of 500 large domestic stocks. Most of you are familiar with that because most of you have some type of an index or index-based accounts with us. The index is commonly viewed as a benchmark for analyzing the performance of the US economy. Let's look at some key events that affected the stock performance in the first half. As we review these milestones, keep in mind that the period was marked by a by an unprecedented combination of economic recovery from a historic economic contraction, physical stimulus, and continued monetary accommodation. This set of conditions won't last forever, so investors should expect that the return and principal value of stock prices will fluctuate as market conditions change. The S&P 500 climbed rather steadily through the first six months of 2021. Despite the headwinds of a political uncertainty and a slow start to the vaccination rollout, 
As the inauguration of the President Biden proceeded on schedule, investors were soon able to focus on the economic fundamentals and progress in managing COVID-19 infections and getting Americans vaccinated. Markets were lifted by the series of positive developments, whether in the form of additional physical spending or the acceleration of vaccination. March saw some particular noteworthy development with the passage of a $1.9 trillion stimulus spending bill and the milestone achieve of 100 million vaccinated by, by our government. In April and early May, markets reacted to solid economic numbers highlighted by the April jobs report and calculations that the U.S. economy grew at a 6.4% annualized rate in the first quarter. Marcus also digested an inflation report that showed a 4.2% increase in consumer prices on a year-over-year -year basis. So we talked about a bit about how the S&P 500 performed during the first half, but how was that step performed compared to expectations? Well, let's take a look. At the end of each year, various media outlets compile many Wall Street analyst predictions for the years ahead or year ahead. This slide shows several projections share at the end of 2020. How do those predictions compare to reality so far? From the previous slide, we can see that the S&P 500 closed May 2021 at 4204. Today, it's even higher than that. The S&P 500 ended 2020 at 3756. Some of the forecasts for 2021 were aggressive and some more modest. As you can see from the table, the market has already exceeded, exceeded one analyst's forecast. Though to be fair, the year is not yet finished. Actually, the number's much higher than that. And we have even more people have forecasted it happen. Predicting whether the S&P 500 will be by the end of the year is always challenging. And while some of the uncertainties with the pandemic have abated, there are other uncertainties emerging that we'll discuss as we move through the presentations. It's worth repeating that the S&P 500 composite index is an unmanaged index that is generally considered representative of the US stock market. So with the approval of several vaccines, more effective vaccination efforts and additional physical stimulus, market sentiments improved as investors became increasingly optimistic that the country might avert another wave of COVID-19 infections and the pieces were in place for an economic reopening. But most of you know, now they're talking about some other variants of the disease or, or the virus whether it's the Delta or Lambda, whatever the feature might be, um, we're trying to figure out how this virus is mutating and what we're able to do. But in the fly, uh, following slides, we'll take a look at the country's progress in fighting COVID-19 and examine how this progress was reflected in the key drivers of a stock market performance. This chart shows the relationship between changes in the S&P 500 performance and the 12 month four earnings per share. I know some of the words and things that I say may be a little bit difficult for you to understand, but keep in mind, this is mainly dealing with the stock market so that some of the words, some of the phrases I may use, you may not understand. If you have a questions, please give me a call so we could chat about that. As you can see, the two lines have generally moved in the same direction over the past decade. But what has happened in the last year? The volatility in stock prices and earnings is the result of COVID-19. As the markets rebounded in the ex expectation of economic recovery, earnings appeared a bit slower to track higher stock prices. Thus, a wide gap between the price and earnings was created. Will they drift back to the historical relationship? That's an unknown that only time will reveal. Here are the couple of reminders. First, past performance does not guarantee future results. Let me repeat that. Past performance does not guarantee future results. 
Over the next 10 years, the correlation between stock prices and corporate profits may look different. Second, individuals cannot invest directly in an index. And third, the return and principal value of the stock prices will fluctuate as the market conditions change. Shares when sold may be worth more or less than the original cost. Now let's look at some economic and financial indicators to help understand how we got here. To put today's economy in perspective, let's look back to January of 2011, slightly over 10 years ago, 10 and a half years ago, when it appeared that the 20, 2008 credit crisis and subsequent recessions were finally receding, this is what the numbers look like. Here you see a 20 speedometer representing 20 indicators from corporate profits to energy costs. And 16 of the 20 indicators were some shade of a green, suggesting the economy had a solid foundation. Just one indicator was red, political environment. Let's fast forward to January of 2021. 10 of the 20 indicators reported positive and strengthening in numbers. But you can see that an equal number of indicators had a neutral or negative rating. In particular, the political environment and geopolitical risk were in red. Just think about what's going on now, what happened in Afghanistan just in a matter of the last few days. It's amazing how fast the politics play our um, influence our stock market. Last week was even more volatile because of that. Things are a little bit settled now because it seems like our finally our government has figured it out how to get our people out of the Afghanistan. I pray for all those people that are still there and people who wanted to get out. And that's I hope that you could also pray for them as well. By May of this year, the speedometers indicated a much improved outlook. 17 were green, three were yellow, and none were red. These improving conditions reflect a number of key developments, including an acceleration in vaccine distribution, falling new infection cases, additional physical stimulus, and improving economic numbers. But as I already said, since June, things have changed a little bit. There are certain states, many states are having a very difficult time dealing with, continue to have problem with the COVID. I understand that they're trying to come up with, I know the Pfizer was just approved 100% uh, as a full approval, but again, it's a people's choice of getting the vaccinated. I hope that if you feel that you need it, please get, get it done. Uh, we have many clients that who have been sick and I, pray that everything works out for everyone for a long term. Let's take a look at a few minutes looking at the path of COVID-19 infections and vaccination. Some believe progress on this health issue was a necessary precondition to economic recovery. As the chart illustrates, new COVID-19 infections appear to have peaked over the latter part of 2020 and early 2021, followed by sustained downward trend in mid-January. This persistent decline helped investors believe we might avoid another strict lockdown. As I already mentioned, because of the increase on some of the infection rates coming back up, but and yet I'm hearing from most people that I talk to that not too many people are happy about the past year's uh, lockdown and they want to continue to live. So we just have to deal with whatever comes to us, whatever the government, whatever our state uh, tell us to do. But I do see a lot of people traveling, a lot of people going back to work. So hopefully that we have gone beyond where we need to be so that we can move forward with this. One of the reasons for the downward trend in the new COVID-19 cases at the beginning of the year was that Americans were being vaccinated in greater numbers. After a slow start, the 
men of national drug retailers help accelerate the pace of the vaccination in March and April. As the chart illustrates above, about 50% of the U.S. population had received at least one vaccination by June, setting the stage for a broader economic reopening in the second half. In addition, nearly 90% of people 65 years of age and older have received at least one vaccination shot. And that's a huge milestone in itself. At the highest level, the Federal Reserve has three functions. To provide an effective payment system for the US, regulate banking operation, and to conduct monetary policies. When conducting monetary policy, the Fed is tasked with supporting maximum employment, stable prices, and moderate long-term interest rates. As it works to uphold its monetary policy goal, one of the indicators monitored by the Fed is the overall level of consumer prices, which helps it determine whether to adjust interest rates. The Fed has stated that it is comfortable with the inflation in the 2% range. The line graph show the core consumer price index over the past 50 years. The core CPI tracks what urban consumers pay for the specific group of goods. This measurement doesn't include energy or food because those prices are often volatile. Some economists use this measurement to track inflation. But as you know, the price of energy has gone up more than 50% in less than a year. And also the food prices have gone up 10, 20%. I know most of the restaurants, because they are hurting so bad, they, are, they have or had to increase their prices for their meals. So if you're going out to eat, you're probably noticing that the cost has gone up drastically. Just being here in Maryland, most of us like eating crabs or crab cakes. Just take a look at the price of what that is down. You don't have as many people working. You don't have as many people picking those crabs. So the price, I understand, for some of the jumbo lump has gone up to 40 plus dollars per pound. So as you can see, that's not way above what it used to be in the $20 range. As you also you can see in the last ticks on the chart, the pand pandemic influence and inflation trends was dramatic, but not unprecedented. Presented, presented. For example, when most states were urging residents to stay at home in May 2020, energy CPI dropped 18.9%. This deceleration in inflation did reverse in the first half of 2021, especially as the economy opened up and pent up consumer demand and supply chain constraints sent prices higher. Inflation worries have crept into the market and we'll discuss those worries and what they mean for investors a bit later in the presentations. Let's take a, mo take a moment to talk about the wages and unemployment. This group shows the unemployment rate and the year-over-year -year wage growth for the past 50 years. Do you notice anything about how these two lines relate to one another? Most of the time, wages and unemployment have an inverse relationship. When one goes up, the other goes down. Notice how wages rose while an unemployment spiked during the pandemic period. One of the reasons for this break in the wage growth on unemployment relationship was that job losses were mostly in the low wage areas of the economy that were shut down by the pandemic, such as the hospitality industry workers. Remarkably, just a year after unemployment jumping to nearly 15%, the unemployment rate has dipped to its 50 year average of about 6% now. Hiring picked up in the first half of the year thanks to the widening economic reopening and broader vaccination distribution. Many economists expect the recovery of the labor market to continue as more and more Americans look to travel and spend. The University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index is one of the most widely used sources to help analysts understand how the average consumer feels about the economy. This index is extremely valuable as it surveys at least 500 residents 
of the continental US each month by a phone. The survey uncovers consumers opening regarding their own finances, as well as business conditions in the country. Understanding how people feel about the economy is essential because consumer spending accounts for more than two thirds of the gross domestic product, also known as the GDP. As the chart indicates, after a pandemic induced drop in consumer confidence, the American consumer is beginning to feel more confident in 2021. In March, for instance, consumer confidence reached its highest level in a year and appeared to be trending higher. Housing is an important contributor to economic growth. New housing starts can increase demand for everything from labor and construction supplies to appliances. At the same time, existing home sales can fuel an increase in the home improvement projects. After a pandemic related slowdown, the housing market started trending higher in May of 2020. We've all read the stories of a pandemic driving interest in homes outside of crowded metropolitan areas or the shift to at home work, creating the need to find a new home with additional room. While it's difficult to say what's next for housing, the outlook for mortgage rates and consumer sentiment may play a big role. As most of you know, the mortgage rates has been the lowest in the last 50 years, and it's continued to stay that way. Today, I heard on the news about the one of the major uh, home builders, Toll Brothers, uh, they had broke all their records. I think that finally, the shortages we had in lumber and everything else is coming back so that more homes are being built. I hope that prices will stay, uh, stabilize because for most of us, uh, price has gone up way too fast in the next tw uh, 12 to 18 months. I think I've heard in some areas in Baltimore, price of their home has gone up 20, 25%. That kind of scares me because, you know, I think about what happened in the year 2007, 2008. I would hope that we don't have to revisit those times. It may surprise some of you to learn that Americans' balance sheet improved in the wake of one of the nation's most rapid and deepest recessions, which of course was ignited by the economic lockdown caused by the coronavirus. As the chart shows, Americans' net worth rose throughout the 2020, while liabilities stayed flat. In part, a stronger balance sheet was the result of a sharp recovery in stock prices and other assets, and the massive physical stimulus that sent trillions of dollars to American individuals and businesses. Remember, past performance does not guarantee future, future results. And the return and principal value of the stock price will fluctuate as market conditions change. In addition, shares when sold may be worth more or less than the original cost. Just remember that. <clears throat> now, before we move on to our outlook for the second half of 2021, let's take a moment to consider the variables that could upend such a forecast. We see three major possibilities that could upset the otherwise optimistic outlook that has so far driven market higher in the 2021. The first is inflation. The Fed has remained steadfast in the position that inflation is likely but will be transitory. As a consequence, he sees no need to change his current accommodative monetary policy regime of near zero rates and his bond purchase program. But what if, if the inflation is not transitory? What if, if the inflation regularly exceeds the federal goal of 2%? As I already shared with you, the cost of goods that we buy whether it is buying things in a grocery store or putting the gasoline in our cars, price has gone up way beyond the 2%. But based on the Fed's position, I think they are gonna try to stay put for a while. And that's another reason why you may wanna consider looking into rebalancing some of your loan portfolios. If you have, higher interest rate loans, you may want to look into if you could reduce that somehow. If you have any concerns or questions or some ideas you want to talk about, please give us a call so then we could 
certainly sit down or at least talk to you over the phone how you could help yourself there. Another risk is a bond yields. Many investors expect bond yields to increase for, for a good reason. Strong economic growth will drive demand for credit. But if that increase is higher and quicker than anticipated, it could unnerve investors. A deceleration in the growth of a corporate profits also looms as a potential risk to stocks. Finally, there is always so-called black swan, something no one expected like a pandemic. Of course, no one can predict what will happen in the future, but we hope the following perspective help you understand what we believe may be on the horizon. Now let's dive into the forecast for the second half. The next chart's gonna be a little bit more difficult to understand, so I'm gonna kind of quickly go through uh, if you want to talk more about the next chart, then we, we could certainly talk about that. After the 2020 fall in real gross, de gross domestic product due to the pandemic-induced economic lockdown, real GDP rebounded very strongly. As you can see from the chart, the Fed is expecting the real GDP growth between the 5 and 7% in 2021, and above average growth again in 2022. In the long run, Fed sees GDP settling into more historical norms. As I said, it's a little bit more difficult graph to understand, but we could certainly talk more about that as a one-on-one. -on -one. If you have any questions, you could give us a call or send me an email. Some market strategists look at the bottom-up earnings per share to help set their price target for the S&P 500 index. When setting a bottom-up EPS, market strategists focus their attention on est estimating earnings for all S&P 500 companies. By contrast, a top-down investing target prices place a greater emphasis on macroeconomic factors when making an investment forecast. The chart shows the bottoms-up EPS and the price of the S&P 500. But a word of caution on this type of anal uh, analysis, just because the Q2 2021 bottoms up EPS has trended higher in the recent months and the price has trended lower, that may not mean the market is undervalued. As you can see in the chart, there is only a loose correlation between the Q2 2021 bottoms up EPS and the price. Here are the few things to keep in mind first. Past performance does not guarantee the results. Second, Individuals cannot invest directly in an index. And the third, the return in principal value stock prices will fluctuate. That's why a lot of you are working with me because we are active money managers. So we keep an eye on, on daily basis, on an hourly basis, what's going on in the market. And if there need to be any tweaking, any changes need to be made, we will do that. Most of you know, how well we have done in the market. If it wasn't for COVID-19, that's something that we have not anticipated, nor can we anticipate anything like that in the future. We certainly have done very well for our clients. You know, with the balance of having money in a safe area and some in somewhat risky or moderately aggressive, our clients, you have done very well. So some of you are listening are people who are not working with us, give us a chance, come and talk to us, work with us so that we could help you to develop a coordinated investment portfolio so that you would have a sound uh, retirement years. The first half of 2021 witnessed growing anxiety about inflation. Inflationary pressures exalted themselves in everything from commodities to consumer goods. There are several reasons for this, such as supply chain bottlenecks as business attempts to return to normal and an uptick in consumer spending thanks to a combination of pent up demand and physical stimulus payments. The concern with the inflation is that it may require the Fed to begin tightening monetary policy sooner than anticipated. The Fed remains steadfast in its belief that the acceleration of inflation will be transitory thus requiring no immediate action to curtail it. The market may not entirely agree with the Fed, 
According to data on the investors' 10-year inflation expectations, as you can see from this chart, inflationary expectations are rising. Increasing, increased inflation, to be sure, was something that investors largely, largely anticipated given the economic rebound from the pandemic lows. However, this chart also says that markets seems to think higher inflation may be more persistent than the Fed believes. The next six months should provide a better picture of inflation, indicating whether rising prices stay close to the Fed's 2% target, or if monthly inflation reports suggest a more sustained move higher. Inflation, investors' inflation concerns may mean that the Wall Street keeps one eye on the Federal Reserve's scheduled meetings in the upcoming months. Investors will be listening closely to the announcement coming from these meetings to gain an insight into whether the Fed will remain current monetary policy. So what could be ahead? Well, the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee meetings is coming up in less than a month, September 21st and 22nd, and then November 2nd through the 3rd, and last one this year being in December 14th through the 15th. Typically, if the Fed is going to make an adjustment in interest rate, it announces the changes following their two-day meetings. Here's another relationship to understand. Bond prices and bond yields have an inverse relationship. In other words, when bond prices go up, bond yields go down. After experiencing years of a low interest rate, many investors may be surprised to realize their bonds can lose money if sold before reaching maturity. And most people are very scared about that. Even with the inverse relationship, especially on also on the other side with the his counterpart, stock, equities. Typically, when I was coming into this business almost 40 years ago, back then it was very simple to understand the stock market. If the market was up, bond prices were down, the bonds were down. If the stock market went down, you can make more money in bonds. But nowadays, things are very, very scary because our stocks are overvalued in some cases. Our bonds, interest rates the lowest it's been. So as soon as the inflation comes and they have to raise the interest rate, the bond prices will go down and then you lose the value of your account. That's the main reason why we have taken different approach to holding bonds. A lot of our portfolios have some bonds, but not as much. And as you know, we deal with the individual stocks and ETFs more than the individual mutual funds. So if you have any concerns about your investments and how to safeguard that, you need to come and talk to us so that we could safeguard it. There are ways to safeguard your money much more than just putting all your money in equities. We feel that we do a great job for our clients because we balance that their portfolios so that whatever the money that they want to save for it, we're able to do it outside of the bonds. And there are guarantee accounts that you could get in. So please give us a call, email us, make an appointment so that we can continue to go over those things with you. Turning our headline noise while managing your finances is not always easy. However, wise investing involves more than reacting to headlines that may discuss consumer sentiment or geopolitical developments. For investing opportunities, one approach is to stay focused on fundamentals like the company's earnings and economic data. I also realize some of you are hearing a lot of noise about some of the other way of investing money, such as cryptocurrencies, meme stocks, meme stocks, so you got a lot of things with the Robin Hood, Reddit, whatever you're hearing. Again, I always tell people those are almost close to gambling. So unless that you want to take a big chance of earning a lot, but realize you may lose it all, you may want to reconsider that. But if you do have any questions about it, we can certainly talk and so that you have a better understanding of it. This slide shows why it's important to tune out the noise and focus on your time horizon, risk tolerance, and goals. And so forget about those meme stocks 
anything that is could be very risky. You can make 20, 30% in a day, but you could also lose 20, 30% in a day. So if you look at the past 15 years, we can see the danger of missing some of the market's best days. As a chart illustrates, the $10,000 investment January 2nd of 20, 2006, it would have increased to more than 41,000 by the end of 2020. Had an investor been out of the market and missed just 10 days of the best days during this period, that investment would be worth less than half, to 18,000. If an investor missed just 20 of the best days in, during this 15 year period, they would have had an annualized rate of return of less than 1%. Miss 30 or more days, an investor will lose money. Basically what this chart tells you is you cannot time the market. That's why when we put together a portfolio for our client, we make little adjustments. We don't make any wholesale adjustment, adjustments all at once. A lot of times because of our research, because of what we are able to do, we are able to monitor your money much closer and better so that most of the time you have your money in the market. But inverse to that, obviously if the market, as we feel they may happen in the next 60 days, <clears throat> If we feel the market's going to go down, we may sell some of the positions and hold some of the money in cash position for a while. And most of you understand what we do with that. If you are not familiar with our strategy, again, uh, get back to us. Well, <coughs> excuse me. At this time, I'm going to close the meeting. But if you have any questions, please email. Please call us. Um, whether you want to do a Zoom meeting or in-person meeting, our office is open fully. So please um, send us a message with any type of questions that we'll get back to you with that. So until the next time, I want to thank you for being with us today. Um, it's been a little bit over 30 minutes, and we try to keep our meetings to about 30. So I hope you enjoyed our webinar, and I look forward to meeting you, seeing you, um, most, I'm hoping that I could do that in person. So God bless. Have a wonderful day.